Hello, my name is Rick Pearson, and this is Prophecy USA, a program specifically designed to unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. In the last four decades, we've seen massive changes take place in America with regards to sexual immorality. But does this have anything to do with America's role in Bible prophecy? Our program today will answer multiple questions from you, our viewing audience, concerning how these changes have not only affected America, but specifically the lifestyle of believers within America. So stay tuned, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Prophecy USA. You know, through television, study guides, and our recent book entitled The Hour That Changes Everything, we've outlined 53 biblical descriptions of the United States of America in Scripture. But perhaps the most obvious description is that of America's founding fathers who based her whole judicial system upon the Judeo-Christian principles, and whether they understood it or not, literally formed a covenant with God. You know, that covenant with God has manifested through her wealth, her military, her global influence around the world, and she's become a lady of kingdoms exactly as Isaiah prophesied 850 years before Christ. And here we sit in the middle of the seventh of eight providential nations in Scripture. However, the lady of kingdoms who brought liberty to all is suddenly described in Revelation 17 as a mother of prostitutes who commits fornication and merchandises it to the kings of the earth. In previous programs, we've told you that the Greek word fornication is pernia, where we get pornography from. And since Hollywood is the number one producer or distributor of pornographic films worldwide, producing one movie every 37 minutes, we came to the conclusion that America meets the 19th description of Babylon the Great, and after her fall, she's called the mother of Pornia. At this point in Babylon's description, a spiritual transformation has taken place when the angel declares to John, fallen, fallen, Babylon the Great is fallen. Jesus warned us of that falling away and grouped believers into seven categories. Today, we're going to answer questions from our Thursday night Bible study podcast concerning two groups of believers who are seduced by Babylon's immorality. We have an abundance of questions concerning this teaching, so before we begin, listen to this quick review and we'll be right back with you. Listen to this. In his admonition to the seven churches, Jesus says, I know your works. He is speaking to practicing Christians who are living during the last days, and he warns us today just as he warned them 2,000 years ago to let him who has ears hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. In essence, he is talking directly to modern day believers. In researching the falling away, or apostasia, of the churches the angel of Revelation addressed, Ephesus, Sardis, and Smyrna, the next group of believers we will look at lived in Pergamos and Thyatira. In Revelation chapter 2 we read, These things I say unto Pergamos, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them that hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to practice sexual immorality. So also some of you hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. But to the one who overcometh, I will give a new name. The fifth church who has a very similar problem with sexual immorality as Pergamos is the modern day church of Thyatira. After affirming the righteous believers in Revelation 2, he continues to warn the rest of the church of Thyatira 
Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. The present-day churches of Pergamos and Thyatira have a problem with sexual immorality. But who exactly is Balaam, the Nicolaitans, and Jezebel? Welcome back, folks. Well, there's a lot to learn about the terminology that Jesus used for both the Pergamos and Thyatira believers. And for those of you who have seen our other programs or used our study guide or read our recent book, The Hour That Changes Everything, you are well aware of what Jesus was talking about. But you know, Karen, when we started doing our Bible study podcast every Thursday at 7 p.m., we realized that people have a lot more questions. They really do, Rick. Yes. And I suppose you have a bunch of them, right? I have a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll fire away. Okay, well, I, I didn't pick the easy ones, I'm sorry to say. This okay. one's from Mary Ann, and she said, Rick, today we have many ministries on television, preaching and teaching. How do we know if a ministry is a Nicolaitan ministry? As a lay person, how do I know who is right and who is wrong? Well, the Bible says, study to show thyself approved, a workman who needeth not be ashamed. But sometimes we need help in understanding scripture. Um, but that's a great question. And one that's very serious for this day and age. Uh, Jesus was very emphatic about this. And you know, Marian, uh, Marian's referring to the believers of Pergamos who are seduced by the Nicolaitan spirit or leadership and were encouraged to test the spirits. Uh, the first sign to look for when you're testing the spirits uh, is every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, this is the spirit of God. So do they recognize Jesus as the only begotten son of God? Do they say that he was born of a virgin, died on the cross for our sins? Do the teachers say that he rose from the dead and he's alive? Now, according to the scripture that we just read, if they don't teach those basic tenets of Christianity, the spirit at work through them is not the same one that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. The second sign to look for for the Nicolaitan spirit is we're dealing with Christian leadership that... Uh, and, and when I say Christian leadership and Nicolaitan, uh, I, I should say that uh, that word Nicolaitan is, is made of two nouns, Nico and uh, Laos. It means to conquer the laity, leadership that conquers the laity. And uh, Paul said, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. Now, he was talking to the church there, and he says these leaders will speak perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And the Oxford Dictionary says that word perverse means to behave unacceptably, and it mainly regards sexual immorality. So Jesus said of the Pergamos church that they hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel uh, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Now Balaam was a false prophet teacher who convinced the children of Israel to marry Moabite women. And these women led the Jews into Baal worship and sexual immorality. And Nicholas of Antioch was a deacon in the church who also led believers into practicing ancient rituals of sexual immorality. So here is a Nicolaitan spirit. Any denomination, pastor, spiritual leader, or prophetic person who sanctions any type of sexual activity outside the realm of holy matrimony between a man and a woman would be considered in scripture a Nicolaitan leader in this interpretation. And they would be following after the ways of the prophet Balaam. Now, Paul taught, by grace are ye saved through faith. And Jesus taught, if ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. And yet, Paul says, 
all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, when Jesus was asked about the woman who was caught in adultery, he said to her accusers, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And all of those accusers left because we're all guilty of sin. But then he turned to the woman and he said, woman, where are thy accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, no. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Jesus did not say, go and live whatever way you want to. He said, go and sin no more. And yet all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, followers of the doctrine of Balaam and leadership that is Nicolaitan have, have no moral restrictions. They will preach a lifestyle that does not warn people of the results of sin, but encourages a lifestyle that appeases your flesh. You know, Paul warns us to be not deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters. This is in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Uh, abusers of themselves with mankind, or thieves, covetous, and such were some of you. But these, these folks will not inherit the kingdom of heaven unless they repent, because Paul said, and such were some of you. But you are washed, you are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord and by the Spirit of God. There are great rewards in following Jesus' teaching. But repenting means to turn away. It doesn't mean to continue in any activity that Scripture tells you is blatantly wrong. And Paul lists all those things where you will miss the mark and literally miss the kingdom of heaven. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with you. Hey folks, have you ever been witnessing to somebody and you just can't remember verses or recall the eight providential nations in scripture, let alone how America meets all 53 descriptions of the seventh nation in Bible prophecy? Well, now Prophecy USA has a free app and every TV program, podcast, and all 53 descriptions of America's role in Bible prophecy will be in the palm of your hand. Together with our study guide, you can study to show thyself approved at any time, any place, and at any given moment. You can even upload the app onto your friend's phone or iPad and let them find out for themselves where this generation fits on God's prophetic time clock. To get the free app, go to prophecyusa.org. And for a donation of $20 or more, we will include a 100-page study guide boldly proclaiming America's role in Bible prophecy. Welcome back, folks. We've been talking about the moral regression within America and how it's affecting believers. The scripture given towards Babylon's moral decline is found in various verses, but perhaps the most obvious one is this. It's directly to Babylon. And it says, Babylon the great has fallen, has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. You know, that word fallen in Greek is the word piptos. It means descending from one level to another. In other words, at one time the standards were higher and now they've become much lower. Instead of progressing society, the lowering of our moral protocol regresses society. And that moral falling away opens the door to demonic activity according to Scripture. And that environment affects the latter-day believers according to Jesus, especially the believers of Thyatira and Pergamos. Now, we have some more questions, Karen. Yes, uh, we do. What do we have here? The next one is from Charles. Charles wants to know, in the church of Pergamos, it says that God will kill Jezebel's children. Who is Jezebel, and why would God kill her children? 
You know, that's a great question from Charles, Karen. And, uh, you know, in 2 Timothy 3.16, the Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 1 Corinthians 10.11 says, Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. The Dictionary of the Bible says admonitions means a loving attempt to correct another's attitude or behavior. And the word example means a pattern or model for imitation. Now, historians tell us that Jezebel was queen under the rule of Ahab in 850 B.C. She was from Phoenicia, and after she married Ahab, she practiced and encouraged Baal worship in Israel. Her spirit and her teachings refer to Baal worship, sexual immorality, and the shedding of innocent blood. Now, Jezebel's dead. Ahab is dead. Believers in Pergamos are dead. But the spirits who manipulated them through their thoughts, their attitudes, and their opinions are alive and well in Babylon. Adultery, immorality, shedding innocent blood was what Elijah stood against on Mount Carmel and said to the priests of Baal, you call on your God and I'll call on mine. That challenge ended up in a fire coming down on the altar of Elijah consuming the sacrifice, and every Israelite cried out, the God of Elijah is the Most High God. Now, those folks were all practicing Baal worship. But as soon as God manifested, they quickly got converted. And then Elijah cut off the head of 450 priests of Baal. You know, it was not a good day at the office for the first church of Baal worship, Karen. <laughs> However... When Jezebel heard this, she was furious. She did not repent. There was no fear of God, no reconciling in her heart that she had done anything wrong. She dug her feet into the soil and she vowed to kill Elijah. In 1 Kings 19.2, she said, so let the gods do to me and more so if I make not thy life as the life of one of them, the dead prophets, by tomorrow about this time. Now notice, Jezebel believed and worshipped other gods. Latter-day Babylon is filled with those little gods who rebel against God night and day. Revelation 18.2 says she becomes the habitation of devils or spirits. So, who are Jezebel's children? They are the ones who follow the same spirits that she followed. They're motivated by the same thoughts, attitudes, and opinions. In 1 John 3.10 it says, Is this the children, in this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Jezebel died a cruel death by being thrown off a balcony, and the dogs came and literally ate her, leaving only her head and her hands as prophesied by Elijah. Believers who think they can emulate Jezebel who practice sexual immorality and sacrifice children to the God of Moloch, according to Scripture, will die in their sins. Now, Jezebel represents a very religious person who thinks they're above God's moral commandments. And they hate anyone who tries to correct them, and they will physically hurt anyone who opposes their demonic lifestyle and practices. You do not want to practice the ways of Jezebel. But if you find that you might have been swayed or seduced by her ways, God has made an easy way out. 
So stay tuned, we'll be right back. The United Nations has a 2030 agenda. The World Economic Forum has a great reset. The COVID-19 pandemic has an accelerated mandate. But as the new world order plans their world without God, nothing will be accelerated faster than the prophetic word God has spoken to the United States of America. It will be the hour that changes everything. Prophecy USA is proud to present their latest book, The Hour That Changes Everything. Together with our study guide and free app, prepare yourself for one of the greatest events in Bible prophecy. Go to prophecyusa.org or call the number on your screen now to make your donation of $35 or more and receive your copy of the book, The Hour That Changes Everything. We are waiting to hear from you. Call today. Welcome back. You know, we just talked about the woman Jezebel, whose life Jesus referred to almost a thousand years after her death. And today, 2,000 years later, he warns us that if we follow after her ways, we will end up just like Jezebel, which was not a happy ending. Now, Karen, we have some more questions from our audience. Um, and one of them, the last one concerned Jezebel and how her ways uh, affect our ways today in our society. But, but you have some other questions w in line with this. What are those? Uh, the next question from, is from Donna, and she refers to the study guide. She said, in the study guide, Rick, you talk about Jezebel, the Nicolaitan spirit, and the doctrine of Baal. What do you think is the contributing factor that allows people to fall into these practices? It's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I think the most obvious contributing factor in all these examples is a lack of fear towards God. Uh, Paul admonished us in Philippians 2.12. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So why would the man who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament tell us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling? Paul was talking about fear that brings multiplied blessings to our lives. You know, Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And likewise, Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. I think I got those turned around. And I asked once a, a liberal pastor who teaches there's no hell if he had any fear of God. And he said, none. None whatsoever, Rick. God is a God of grace and forgiveness, which I might add is very, very true. And then he quoted John 3.16. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loved the whole world. He died for everybody, Rick. But you know, he didn't finish that verse. He didn't say that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And how do you believe on him? 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You know, this woman, Jezebel, had no fear of God even after he consumed the altar with fire from heaven. And Jesus said to the believers of Pergamos, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you. You tolerate that woman of Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality. I gave her time to repent, but she refused to repent of her sexual immorality. You know, believers of Pergamos had no fear of God. They believe they can continually violate God's moral protocol of Scripture, and God will continue to forgive them. Now, these people are living a fool's dream, and it's all rooted in the spirits that controlled Jezebel and are now seducing them. He said that Jezebel was teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality. 
Do you know that according to Isaiah 11, fear is one of the seven spirits or characteristics of God's presence. But this is not the same fear we are accustomed to. Fear in this case means to have a holy reverence towards God. You know, according to Bible prophecy, the Messiah, Jesus, would supernaturally manifest the seven characteristics of God. In Isaiah 11, 2 says, And the Spirit of the Lord would rest upon him, Jesus, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and fear of the Lord. In fact, in Luke 4, 18, Jesus referred to this passage in Isaiah by saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he accomplished that task in the Garden of Gethsemane by literally sweating blood when he said, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. When Jesus preached to his disciples, he taught them, don't fear man who can kill your body, but fear him who can destroy both you and your soul in hell. Now, if there is no hell, why did Jesus warn his disciples that there was one? And why is the word hell mentioned 23 times with multiple descriptions in Scripture? Jesus overcame the fear of man when he decided to fear God and follow his instructions. And the good news is, we do not have to fear God if we just follow those instructions. So don't be like Jezebel, and don't be like Balaam, and don't listen to the spirits who control them. Instead, believe what the Apostle John instructed us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Paul reminded us, don't be deceived about fornicating and idolatry and adultery and lying. They will not enter the kingdom of heaven, but we've been justified, we've been washed in the blood, sanctified in the name of Jesus by the Spirit of our God. All you have to do, if you've fallen into any type of immorality, is just say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and be Lord of my life. Now, if you prayed that prayer, let us know, because we'd love to hear from you. Now, unfortunately, Karen, we are out of time. We've been answering all these questions, and we got a ton more. So this is Rick and Karen Pearson from Prophecy USA saying Jesus is alive, and he's coming back much sooner than many people realize. We'll see you next week with more questions to answer. Shalom.